Welcome to another installment of Monday q and I hope you've all had an awesome weekend. To everybody who submitted questions for this week's Q&A, thank you very much. And thank you all for the continued support with the channel and the podcast. And to everybody who supports me directly on Patreon or anyone who went and grabbed the new Ragdoll single, Sky's Limit. It really means a lot to me. I do love doing these Monday Q&A videos because I make a lot of videos during the week and I make a bunch of noise. Uh, try a bunch of different things on here. And these Q&A videos are always a nice way for me to just kind of center myself and I guess keep in touch with the people who actually watch and support the channel. So thank you very much. If you have a question you would like me to answer on next week's video, put it in the comment section below and check the video description if you want to support my channel directly. Let's go. My thoughts on the ideal strap height for guitar players. This is a tricky one, right? Because it's a trade off between being able to play really, really accurately and having good ergonomics, you know, having your straps slightly higher so that it's going to be very similar to the way you would play sitting down. I did a video at the start of the year talking about how I changed the way I sit with a guitar recently, and that really helped with some back and neck and shoulder issues that I have been having that kind of all just trace their way to playing too much guitar with poor posture. So I would say if you're playing guitar standing up a lot, then having a higher strap is definitely going to work in your favor, but also having a low strap looks cool. So <laughs> whether you're somebody who goes more the Tom Morello route or the Tom DeLonge route, somewhere in between there is probably going to be the way. I always think once you kind of get that trade off between, you know, is it a bit too low where I am feeling that my wrist is stretched or my shoulders feel uncomfortable or out of balance and you should probably raise your strap height a little bit and then sometimes you know I raise my strap too high and I look at photos of myself playing guitar and I just look like an absolute dork. I look like an absolute dork anyway so I think it all comes down to what makes you comfortable and what you're going for when you're playing guitar standing up you know are you doing it in the studio or at home? Is it part of your workflow? Or is it something you do in a performative setting? Because, you know, having a low strap looks cool. So uh, having a low strap can look rock and roll. Having a high strap can look rock and roll as well. I think uh, rock and roll doesn't really come down too much to what anybody tells you to do. It's more about an attitude. So I'm kind of curious, what does everybody watching this video do? Are you somebody who plays at home primarily and do you sit down or do you stand up at home? I recently got a sit stand desk. So I've been playing guitar standing up a lot more at home and actually really, really enjoying it. And I try to always practice standing up in the days leading up to a show as well. So I don't get any rude surprises when I you know, try to do that six string sweep arpeggio that I've been playing sitting down with my guitar up here, but you know, I've got my guitar hanging around my waist. So let me know what you all do in the comment section below. It'll be kind of interesting to see what the preferences are. We talked about the Damasio Super Distortion last week. What about the Damasio HS3? This is, it's actually an Ingve neck on a warmoth body, but with an Ingve pick guard. Uh, this has HS3s in it. And I'm really surprised at how mellow they are. They sound like really, really mellow vintage strap pickups in there. So I can see why Ingve you know, uses the Dodd 250 with everything cranked up into Marshalls with HS3s because they're quite quiet, they're quite mellow sounding. Uh, that kind of makes sense. You know, you would think with Ingve that he would have these extremely high output pickups, but obviously Ingve likes the vintage stuff. So in terms of noiseless single coils, they're pretty good. I've tried the HS2s as well. They're also pretty good. You know, Ingve and Eric Johnson can't be wrong. But I will say that if you really, really want a kind of classic Strat sound, they're probably not the pickup. You know, they've got their thing that they do. And I think they're kind of designed for that like 80s style rig where you have a bunch of outboard processing. So you do most of it in the rig rather than on the guitar. I much prefer the sound out of my Sir MLs that I've got in my 77 Strat. I mean, sure, the MLs are a little bit noisier than this guitar, but then you've got to boost this a whole bunch. So. I don't want to take them out of this guitar because, you know, this is the Ingve guitar. I really, really like the way it sounds. But again, if you were going for a classic Strat thing, I would probably look elsewhere. All right, the best Mesa Boogie amps. I'm going to say Mesa, trigger warning. I know it's meant to be pronounced Mesa, but I've been saying Mesa my whole life. You know, that's just what we say down here in Australia. We ruin everything for everybody. So I just keep that in mind because I'm going to say that a whole bunch during this. They're a company that I think has put out more good things than bad things. 
the three classics, though, the three undisputed awesome amps are the Mark series, whether you're a 2C+, plus, a Mark III, a Mark I, a Mark IV, a Mark VII person. Those amps just have a sound and they feel a certain way to play. Personally, I would go with a Mark IV. I've got a Mark IV Revision B that I absolutely adore. It's got the extra channels on there. It's got the mid gain mode on the lead channel. It's just a beautiful, beautiful machine. The Rectifier as well. I didn't like Rectos for so long. I think the first time I tried a Recto and the first time I tried a Mark, I was really unimpressed actually. So it uh, just kind of goes to show that sometimes your first impressions with gear uh, are not to be trusted. But, you know, didn't get the Recto thing for ages. I played one as a backline amp once and really didn't get on with it. And then I tried a Roadster and we recorded Rewind Your Mind with that amp and I went, well, I recorded with this amp, I've got to go and get one. I bought my old Rev G. That boosted with a Klon style pedal is kind of the bedrock of the guitar tone on the Ragdoll Back to Zero album. So I like the two channel Rectos. I know some people like the three channels and the Multiwatts and the Roadsters and the Road King. I'm going to say the two channel Recto is an absolute classic. And then the third one that I think most people absolutely love is the Lone Star. I was lucky enough to borrow a Lone Star special recently. Big shout out to Neil and Kale for letting me do that. And it's gorgeous. It's one of the best clean guitar sounds I've ever experienced. And the lead channel is so silky and so smooth. I think if you're not primarily like a rock or metal player, if you're doing blues or fusion, or even if you're doing a pop gig, that amp is kind of perfect. It can cover everything you would need. It takes pedals really, really well. It's got a great loop. It's got the power scaling on it. You know, they would be my three picks. And then you've got stuff like the Stiletto, the Royal Atlantic. There's the Jewel Calibers as well. Uh, there's not many things they've made that aren't awesome. Obviously, the Triaxis and the Studio and Quad preamp. I will say I didn't really like the Formula preamp when I tried it. And then the Nomad, I remember trying one ages ago and it was okay. Again, nothing bad. Nothing where you go, wow, this thing's an absolute turd. Just kind of underwhelming compared to the others. So what's your favorite Mesa Boogie amp? Let me know in the comment section below uh, and be specific. You know, if it's a Mark III Red Stripe or if it's a Mark II C non-plus version, you know, that's that's the kind of fandom with these amps, isn't it? Uh, I will quote uh, my buddy James Lugo who said, you know, at the end of the day, it's just an amp, not a lifestyle, but it kind of is a lifestyle. Last week, I talked about sound memory, specifically in reference to comparison clips. The idea being that if you're doing a comparison between two pieces of gear and you want to know if something's brighter or darker or more saturated than the other, and you sort of play a clip, then you talk about the clip, then you play another clip, that's a pretty bad way to do the comparison because <laughs> your ears are nowhere near as good at kind of remembering what was brighter or darker when you've got a gap in between or something else talking. If you crossfade those two clips, your ears are gonna do a much better job in there. So when I was talking about sound memory, I was specifically talking about that thing where you're comparing things, say comparing mixes or, you know, volume is another important factor in there because our ears do not have a very linear response to frequency and volume. Sound memory, when it comes to things like, uh, I'd say the analogy is like taste, like, you know, you kind of eat a piece of broccoli or you eat a cheese sandwich or you eat a really nice steak and you sort of develop this memory of, I guess, what to expect. You expect the taste to be in a certain ballpark. Sound can be like that, you know, you <laughs> a Les Paul through a Marshall. There's probably uh, an impression that you get just by looking at that which is why the saying ears, not eyes, is very important when it comes to audio because, you know, audio is something we listen to with our ears and our brains process it. And, you know, yeah, our eyes can sometimes deceive us when it comes to sounds, which actually leads into the next question because last week I talked about gear that's kind of overhyped. So what about the opposite? Gear that had a lot of hype behind it that I was expecting not to like that I ended up really, really enjoying. I'm going to say for years and years, I kind of ignored the hype behind the Axe FX, and then I finally tried one and it actually blew me away at how good it was because you read about it and you go, oh, okay, cool. It can do amp modeling. Yeah, I've tried a pod. I've tried these other things. It must just be marketing hype because there's no way something digital can sound as good as tubes. And then I played one for the first time and that was a pretty important moment in my guitar playing journey. I think in my life in general, because it just smashed my pre-existing 
thoughts and concepts and it just sounded really, really good. And <laughs> now I do a lot of stuff where I basically kind of demonstrate that that stuff can sound really, really good and that it can be really, really responsive. And we're living in an age where the gear you play, uh, it's more about personal choice than it is about, you know, some overarching, no, only these things sound good and accurate and these other things, yeah, they're fun, but really no one's gonna use them in a pro context. So that's definitely one. Another one would be, I mean, I tried a carbon fiber guitar by Rubato Guitars not too long ago and I had some, uh, let's say, pre-existing thoughts with that. I knew it would sound fine. You know, I knew it would sound like a guitar because I tried some guitars out of, uh, you know, various materials like aluminium necks and plastic bodies and things like that. Uh, but that kind of surprised me as to like how ergonomic and, you know, it's a weird thing to say about a guitar, but like warm and homely it felt. I always associate kind of composite materials like that with, <laughs> you know, let's say uh, like cars and things that don't feel like a guitar because a guitar is such a tactile thing. I think the fact that they use wood on the fretboard on that really, really helps. But, you know, if you've ever played a guitar with like an aluminium neck, you know, it's kind of weird because the neck's cold. But uh, yeah, I guess that's just ignorance about, you know, different building materials and fibers on my end. But playing that guitar for the first time was like, sounds really good, but it also feels really good in my hands. So the composite guitars, that is definitely one. Uh, another one, Strandberg guitars, I'd heard about the necks on them and the kind of endura, you know, ergonomic thing that they've got going on. And <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't expect to like that at all. And you play one for five minutes and pick up a normal guitar and the normal guitar feels weird. So that's definitely one. Same thing with guitars with scallop fretboards. I thought yeah, it'll be great for lead playing, but it won't be good for playing chords. And I've got an Ingve Strat and I've done lots and lots of gigs on that where I'm mostly playing chords around the third and the fifth fret on it. That sounds really, really good. So as always, I'm gonna throw this out to all of you. What are some pieces of gear that, you know, you didn't expect to love, but you ended up really, really enjoying? Maybe they changed the way you think about, say, guitar or pedals or amps or anything like that. Uh, I think as well, like I mentioned Mark series and rectifier amps previously, you know, didn't like either of those the first time I tried them. And then when I learned how to dial them in, uh, my life changed. Now I love those amps. So that's just kind of how, how it goes sometimes, isn't it? I mentioned acoustic guitars on last week's video. Really, really good response to that. So I will have to do that video talking about some of my acoustic guitars and I guess how I use them in a live context and how to record them. That might actually be a really good episode idea for the gear podcast. Uh, might go around to Troy's studio and then try some things out. So let me know what you'd like to hear. But for recording acoustic guitar, you know, I guess the kind of standard issue stuff is a small diaphragm condenser. You know, you point it around the 12th fret towards the sound hole and you play it and it probably sounds good. Put a bit of compression and reverb on it, a bit of EQ. And if you've got a good acoustic guitar, then you can probably get a good acoustic guitar tone out of it. Uh, one thing that I found is that the acoustic guitars that record really well and the acoustic guitars that sound good live aren't necessarily gonna be the same thing. And I always remember a buddy of mine who was working in a studio that we were recording out of, who'd done a lot of recording saying that, you know, they had an old Martin and then somebody bought in a new top of the line Taylor and the Taylor sounded incredible on its own, but it, it was like too much in the mix. There were sort of too many overtones popping out and it clashed a little bit with some of the other instruments. Whereas the Martin on its own, compared to the Taylor sound a little bit flat, but when you put it in a mix, it just worked, which reminds me of so many different types of amps. You know, you get something with hyped up low end and scoop mids and lots of top end on its own. You're like, yeah, this is great. And then it disappears in a mix. So yeah, some different things there. I've also just recorded uh, <laughs> acoustic guitar with like an SM57 sitting on a desk and uh, done that or a, you know, SM7, which I'm using for my vocal mic at the moment. I recorded guitars for a friend's album recently and had to do some acoustic parts and they needed them quickly. So I don't have a small diaphragm condenser here. So I just grabbed the SM7, sent it to them and said, does it work? And they said, yeah, it works totally fine. You know, the acoustic isn't going to be a huge thing in the mix. So yeah, I've also done it that way. And I guess if you have a guitar and a microphone, you can probably make it work. One last one for this week. This one comes from a viewer who said they are looking for a Les Paul Jr. They've tried out a bunch of new guitars, but none of them feel right. What should they do? I would say one of two things. One, maybe you don't actually want a Les Paul Jr. guitar. And this would be the case that, you know, I've been in where I've just 
heard clips or seen photos of guitars and I've convinced myself that I love it without even playing it. And then when I play it, I kind of go, oh, this doesn't really feel right. And you kind of go through those stages of grief with it where you're like, oh, no, but it should sound good. And then you just kind of realize that, well, it looks cool, but it's not right for me, you know? That's situation number one. So maybe you're in that camp where actually a Les Paul Jr. isn't what you want. Maybe you want a Telecaster or, or an SG or a Les Paul with humbuckers in it. That might be the case. In the case that you've tried a Les Paul Jr. that somebody has and you loved it and you went, well, right, I like that guitar. I'm going to go to the store and buy one of those. My advice would be, Find the guitar that you fell in love with, you know, if it belongs to a buddy or, you, again, it was in a different shop. If you can get access to that and play it and really take it, take time to consider what you like about it. Is it the way that it plays? Is it the fret height? Is it the gauge of strings on there? Is it the setup? Is it the way the pickups are wired up? And use that to try and find a guitar that gives you a similar vibe that's not necessarily doesn't have to be a Les Paul Jr. Just sort of go, you know, for me, whenever I play a guitar with 6,100 frets, I go, oh yeah, this is party time for me. So when I go and look at new guitars and I stumble across something I like, often it's because it's got big frets or it's a pickup thing. Or sometimes it's just the vibe. Sometimes you just pick up a guitar and it has vibe and you go, yeah, this is the one. So maybe rather than try to find a Les Paul Jr. that you vibe with, just open your mind and go, you know what? I'm going to go and try a bunch of different stuff. And I'm just going to find a guitar that I vibe with and go with that because sometimes the scientific stuff can be really, really important when it comes to guitars and music, but also music, there's more to it than just measurement. You know, it is about emotion and feeling and things that you can't really quantify in the human experience. It's about those, it's almost about those immeasurable things sometimes, you know. The more you measure, <laughs> sometimes the less you know with these. So that would be my advice. You know, maybe you actually don't want a Les Paul Jr. Uh, maybe you do and you just like the vibe of it and there's other guitars out there which can give you a similar vibe. This is all part of the quest though, you know. Uh, there is a lot to be said about going through that process of figuring out what you like rather than somebody telling you what you like. Because if you figure it out yourself, it's just going to be a totally different experience than someone going, just buy this and do it. That's how you make music. I don't think music's really about that. So that's it for this week's Q&A. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you have any questions for next week, put them in the comment section below. Again, thank you for your support with the channel. Have a great week and I'll see you next time. Cheers.